Hello and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions based on what you've left for me in the comment section of my Critical Q&A videos or have sent to me by email at askchrisshelton at gmail.com. All right, first thing is 200th episode of Sensibly Speaking podcast went up yesterday and uh, I really, really hope you guys check it out because it was an amazeballs episode. I had Marcy Hamilton, who is a, a legal scholar and expert on the uh, establishment clause of our Constitution. That is what she has devoted her uh, entire professional career to working on, studying, knowing all about, and uh, actually trying to do uh, progressive legal work to enforce uh, proper use of the establishment clause on all sides, and uh, specifically to take down people who are abusing their rights as religious organizations uh, or individuals so that uh, the public at large and especially children are protected from uh, pred predation that occurs in religions across the board. It's not a, a, a matter of singling out any one group. Uh, but this definitely includes the Church of Scientology. And our talk was uh, pretty pretty wide-ranging, pretty interesting. I was absolutely uh, was so happy to have her on my podcast. And, uh, and of course, it's 200 episodes. I never imagined that when I started that podcast that I would be getting up to 200 episodes, kind of similar to my Q&A show here. So anyway, I really encourage you guys to check that out. I'm, I'm really pumped about that Sensibly Speaking podcast this week. And uh, more good content coming uh, in, the, in the very near future here. I've got some really good plans for the rest of the year on, on what's coming on my channel. So, that all being said, let us go ahead and get on with your questions now. Sid Whittle, if a public learns of the confidential info found in OT3 and higher, how does the church handle that? It must come out in auditing somehow. Is it reported to ethics? And if so, what does that mean for the individual? What if someone learns the secrets before they are ready, quote unquote, and then they get to OT3 and realize that what they heard was actually true? What would the reaction be? Do you have any firsthand knowledge on that happening to someone? Okay, so uh, finding out about OT3 or confidential Scientology information before you get to it. Um, here is what I can tell you from my own firsthand experience on this. I worked at the Advanced Organization of Los Angeles, and I worked on the line where people who were at the level of clear were coming along and doing the steps necessary to get onto the OT levels. So I was right at the entrance gate of people going onto those levels, and we had to do what's called a security check to ask them a whole bunch of uh, standardized questions on the e-meter and make sure that one of the things they had not done was look into or find out about the confidential information online or through any other means, like through books or anything like that. And they are very thorough about this. They really want to make sure. There are a couple reasons for that. The, the stated reason within the world of Scientology that you have to get sec checked on that and they, that they rake you over the coals about it is because you're expected in going on to the OT levels to be entrusted with what Scientologists consider to be the literal secrets of the universe and life itself. This is supposed to be the big, top, high quality, unbelievable information that man has been striving for from day one of man being man, <laughs> right? Of, of human beings even existing in the world. Why are we here? What is it all about? What is going on in the big wide universe? Uh, what, wh who are we really? Why do we act the way we do? Like all of these and many, many more questions, including the nature of spirituality and God, all of this stuff is supposed to be answered on these OT levels. Hubbard calls them the living lightning, the, the, the stuff that makes up life itself and blah, 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 all this uh, marketing and promotional stuff about these OT levels. But he really, truly did seem to believe that he hit on something very, very important with all of this. And it wasn't just about the space aliens and Xenu, it was about rehabilitating people spiritually and giving them power. In Scientology, again, the view is that as an operating Thetan, you are going to have powers and abilities far beyond the normal ken of men, right, and women, or, you know, human beings, right? You're going to be uh, rehabilitating your spiritual powers and abilities, and you're going to have 
um, responsibilities connected with that, and they're not willing to just give that information to anybody. They want people who are going to keep the information secure. So if you're the kind of person who's looking for a shortcut or a roundabout or has been exposed to this information because you purposefully went and looked for it, then you are somebody who cannot be trusted with these secrets because you couldn't wait your turn, you couldn't wait to be ready, and you uh, are just trying to get something for nothing, right? That's that exchange factor in Scientology. Uh, Hubbard was always uh, so so adamant about. So so that's the 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 idea as to why there's all this security surrounding this information. Now, obviously, you know from an outsider perspective, and I now know as a person who used to be and no longer is in Scientology that. All of this is nonsense and that these answers, you know, supposedly quote unquote answers that they're giving you are just more hogwash and, and, and nonsense. Uh, they don't answer any of the questions that we would like answered and they don't help a person resolve their life difficulties or problems. OTs go bankrupt just as much, if not more, as than regular Scientologists and people at large. They develop cancer and leukemia and bad eyesight and all the host of problems that any pe people who get old and, and live life here on this earth as a human being, all those same problems OTs experience at the same rate and at the same intensity as any other human being, uh, or WOG as they like to call them in Scientology, a very derogatory term. So, uh, so there isn't anything special about this knowledge or information, but Scientologists have really built this up, man. I mean, they really think this is the, this is what's going to handle everything and all the sacrifices and all the work that they do is just to get this OT information. Um, so having worked at the Advanced Org in Los Angeles, and, uh, right on this line, what I saw myself is that there was a guy who came along who had been studying the OT materials online. This was um, 2003, four around that time period. Uh, and the case supervisor who oversees, you know, these security checks and, and granting somebody the approval, you know, she was literally the one who had the approval stamp. Uh, you know, then it had to go to RTC who gave final approval on every single person who went on to the OT levels. Uh, she was like, um, you know, yeah, no, he's never going to get on the OT levels. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So he's seen this stuff online and maybe it's screwy, maybe it's not. We didn't really get into that too much. I didn't ask her about it. But I have been told by other Scientologists that they truly believe that the information online is not true, is, is what they call squirrel OT levels. It's not the real L. Ron Hubbard written and approved OT levels. Um, and of course, you know, at this point, for all you and I know, it might not be anymore because they could change that OT data, <laughs> you know, in, in fairly significant ways and make it so that the stuff that's online now isn't what people get. I mean, they could always do that. Uh, nobody would really know or even care that much. They would put it out. I mean, uh, Miscavige could do anything. Uh, and get away with it, uh, like certain other individuals, right, cult leaders, who can say or do anything, and the cult followers will simply take it in stride, come up with some rationalization for why that has to be that way, and carry on as though it's no big deal, even if it's the most hypocritical, outrageous, nonsensical thing you could imagine. So, uh, anyway, but as far as people get on, on these levels, uh, they will not be allowed on the levels if they have proven that they cannot be secure. And exposing yourself purposefully to those materials will definitely tell the church that you are not somebody who can be trusted with that information. Now, as far as somebody getting on to it and then seeing it and going, well, this is what I read, well, that's the exact thing they're trying to prevent, right? So if somebody were to successfully withhold that they had looked at that information online, or if they accidentally had seen some part of it, that, that person might get onto the OT levels, right? Because that church wouldn't know. Or they would know that this person might have heard the word Xenu somehow, because it's pretty common. It's kind of hard not to hear it in relation to Scientology. Or they might have heard some other bit or piece of something. In that case, 
um, they might look at the OT materials and go, oh, well, Xenu is real, so that was right. But they're not going to necessarily think that what they read online is going to be uh, Hubbard's given word because what they're reading, well, all the things they had to work for and invest in and all of that are going to convince them that this is the real deal and whatever they saw or, or heard about isn't and is just, you know, like I said, squirrel. That's a big deal. They have to invalidate the stuff that's online. They have to invalidate us as critics, you know, anybody who's critical of Scientology, etc. Um, so also the other thing, though, let's say that you had somebody who saw South Park, you know, somebody tied him up, you know, and did a um, Clockwork Orange deal on him, right, and made him watch South Park, right? and made him read the OT levels, right? And then he goes and he goes, I wasn't my fault and I, I wasn't responsible and they tied me up and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that would itself be a whole thing. But <laughs> let's just say in this stupid example I'm giving here that somebody had seen all of it and was somehow allowed on the OT levels and they saw that it matched up, that it was, that it was, the, that it was the same stuff, right? They wouldn't really care. Like they might go, oh, well, that's crazy. They're endangering people out there by showing them this stuff. But if they're allowed on there and they actually do it and they're still in the mindset of being a Scientologist, then they're going to just, you know, be able to put a curtain over that and they're, uh, between them and that, that whole thing. And they're not going to, it, it wouldn't really throw them in other words, right? Because that's not where their cult mindset came from. So that's not what's going to undo it. <laughs> you see what I mean? Uh, so I think that's pretty much the best way I could answer that. But I really want to stress that the church is really, really adamant that, at least from my experience on this, that anybody who's been exposed to that information, and especially on purpose, isn't going to be allowed to go on the OT levels. Or they're going to have to do such an amends project, as they call it. They're going to have to do so much work to show and prove that they are dedicated, loyal, secure Scientologists who can be trusted, that by the time they get done with all that work, they will be fully back in the Hubbard mindset, right? And any doubts, wanderings, whatever they might have had about the subject are going to be gone, and they'll be fully invested, and they'll be full, true believers again. So, I don't know. That's, uh, that's some of my thoughts on that. Leo P., how does David Miscavige get paid? How does he justify his salary? Okay, I can only tell you all of this secondhand, but what I have heard is that David Miscavige collects $50 a week just like everybody else, but, or 100 or whatever it is now, but he gets uh, money through a couple of different other avenues. Uh, one, bonuses or commissions for, let's say, IAS memberships. Uh, you know, when people sign up for International Association of Scientology memberships, which they pay, you know, thousands of dollars for, there's usually a commission on that. And uh, I'm told that when David Miscavige does briefings about the IAS or, you know, does uh, promotion for it, that he could justifiably be paid commissions on anybody at that event who signed up for the IAS. I don't know that that would be a regular, I mean, I never heard of that actually happening when I was in. But at the same time, that's not the sort of thing that anybody ever would have told me about. I only heard about it after the fact. So I could see something like that happening. There are also lots of other bonuses that they get paid, or they literally pay themselves. In the same way that Congress can vote itself a pay increase, Miscavige can vote himself a pay increase for any reason at all. And maybe... At a certain level, Miscavige has even paid a salary. I mean, that would not that would be completely okay with the IRS. There wouldn't be any sort of tax fraud or problem there as long as he was paying his taxes on it. And I'm quite sure that David Miscavige pays his taxes. This is a man who is not going to cross the IRS. So, um, so he could get money through some kind of bonus system. He could get money by just simply allocating money to himself as long as it's not extravagant or too exorbitant uh, in the eyes of the IRS, that would be the people he'd be watching. Otherwise, very, very few people would have any knowledge within the world of Scientology or the Sea Org about how much he was paying himself. And uh, then the other thing that Miscavige gets is he gets gifts. 
Uh, he is gifted, you know, very extravagant birthday presents and parties and things like that, all on the dime of the Sea Org. Um, like, for example, at Christmas, money is collected from Sea Org members around the world, and presents are purchased for Miscavige at every continental zone. Uh, so all the, you know, European Sea Org members who work at the management base there have to give over, you know, a few bucks at Christmas for Miscavige and also on his birthday. And they've purchased him motorcycles and clothes and, you know, cars. You know, I've, I've heard that I think he got a BMW one year or something. So, uh, so that, you know, that, that kind of thing happens to him. He gets, he gets inundated with stuff. This is a man who is never going to want for anything. He can arrange things in different ways, however he wants, so that he is on a total free ride the entire way. Uh, and, of course, this is easily justified because David Miscavige is the spiritual leader of the ecclesiastical movement that is taking over the world, don't you know? So, of course, he should be given a uh, million dollars a month and more. I mean, Scientologists are just so brain dead on this. I have literally talked to Scientologists who have said he deserves everything he gets and 10,000 times more, and they would never have a problem with it. So, you know, that's kind of where, where the Scientologists are at on that, on that topic. Jane Smith. How do Scientologists justify clearing the planet, but only helping the able to be more able? And clearing the planet, but no free services. Only a small percentage of the world's population can afford Scientology services. Well, this is easy. See, Scientologists think that by doing Scientology, you will become more able, and you will therefore be more able to get a better job, get a promotion, make your own kind of job or company or something, be a real self-starter, real go-getter, pick yourself up by your bootstraps kind of thing, and then you will be uh, in a better position to, you know, do the world more good and yourself more good and make yourself get on up the bridge and maybe employ other people. In other words, there's supposed to be the concept here that I'm trying to get across is that that individual Scientologists who come into Scientology have the idea that they are going to get better and better and more expansive and more responsible and more influential, and they will therefore get richer. And uh, and that and that by getting that the 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 able people, the ones who are already on their way to that, and and giving them a little boost, we get a big effect out in the environment. Right. This is kind of the social thinking of Scientologists is that by making, you know, grabbing the able guys first and giving them the little boost that they need so they can start a company, employ other people, pay them, etc. Uh, you know, I guess it's sort of trickle down religion. <laughs> Um, you know, this is kind of how it's supposed to propagate, and that by coming in, by coming within the orbit of a Scientologist, the non-Scientologist will see, oh wow, this is something that I should be doing something with, and maybe they only start by buying a book and reading that. Anybody can do that. You can go to the library and do it, and just by reading Hubbard's words, you're supposed to become more able and more amazing. And you apply that information and, and again, bootstrapping your life, right? It's a very self-starter kind of attitude. You know, he uh, who is most helped is the one who helps himself. So, uh, and that is the definition of being able, is you are responsible for your own condition and you are responsible for your finances and your wealth and your influence. And so if you don't have the theta gumption, right, or you don't have the, like, you know, theta power, uh, to get yourself in that position, well, in a way, you're sort of looked at as somebody who doesn't deserve Scientology, actually. Um, this is why Scientologists have a very classist kind of view about society, and they are very certain that they are the elite, just by the fact that they're in Scientology at all. And they uh, very quickly get themselves into the frame of mind that by continuing Scientology and by staying ethical, and being a good little Scientologist and paying their dues and putting in their time and doing the coursework and doing the auditing work, that they will make it to OT and this position of being cause over life, where they can then help other people as part of the picture, but also, you know, mostly help themselves. 
uh, but that helping themselves does include this vague sort of idea that they will be helping other people and also, there's a spiritual component to this. It's a very impractical kind of thing. I'm talking in these sort of vague, weird ways about how they're going to help the rest of the world because this is how Scientologists think about it. They don't get really down and dirty with the details of this. It's all sort of vague maunderings. But uh, spiritually, the other factor here is that by getting up to the OT levels and especially getting on to OT5 and 7, you are you personally, as an OT, going into session every day, are creating more and more theta in the environment. And of course, we've you know talked many times about theta, spiritual substance or or good spiritual energy, I guess you could call it. It is the stuff that makes up a thetan. So you're converting the N theta of this world to theta, right? Oh, it's all so wonderful. And the more free theta there is in the world, the more you're boosting the overall condition of everyone. The lowliest bum, uh, you know, drugged out uh, heroin addict on Hollywood Boulevard will to some small degree be spiritually assisted and therefore life assisted and physically assisted by an OT going into session in Clearwater or Montana or wherever they live and doing the OT procedures to free up the body thetans to create more theta in the world. This is the thinking of the OTs in Scientology. This is how they tell themselves that they are the ones who are saving the world. So that's a whole other component of making the able more able is that by getting 10,000 people on OT7, this is the big target of all targets that's never going to be achieved, get 10,000 people on OT7, auditing five, six sessions a day, freeing up all these body thetans, creating all this wonderful free theta in the world, that this is what's going to make it so that the world doesn't involve itself in wars and in criminality and insanity and instead will uplift everybody, okay? So I think, the, you know, those are the ideas that Scientologists have, at least from my own experience with it, that convince them that they're on the right track and that eventually, kind of if you could imagine on a long term, some kind of theta shovel is going to come along and eventually get everybody, right? But we can't start with, if we involve ourselves, oh yeah, here's the other aspect of this, is reversely, if Scientologists involve themselves with just handling the disabled, then all of their attention and time and effort and money goes solely into these people who are kind of theta vampires. They're theta suckers. They just take and take and take and they never give anything back because they're not able to, right? Why put all your time and effort into them? They just, they're just sponges. They don't contribute anything. So they're not the ones to deal with first. We'll get around to them eventually. First, we have all these able people, these people who do hold down jobs and own houses and cars and kids and, and hold down responsibilities and have proven that they are people who are of, are, are of worth. And yeah, it is kind of like that, you know. They don't necessarily say it exactly that way. They say it worse, <laughs> actually. Uh, you know, these, these the, the, the N theta scumbags, the SPs, the PTSs, they don't deserve Scientology, right? They have to, Scientology is something you have to earn. Remember Tom Cruise talking about that in that, that uh, turtleneck video? It's something you're, you're, you're privileged to be a Scientologist, right? You have to earn it. And you have to continually keep earning it. And those theta suckers and sponges, they're not earning anything. So they don't really deserve the time or effort of Scientologists. And that is the kind of conversations that Scientologists have. So I hope that answers that question. S. Fitzgerald. I was Googling the history of various recreational drugs and was surprised slash alarmed that Narconon occupies the top science. I read through a few of the pages and found the information well-researched, referenced, and didn't try to plug its treatment. Could you concede that Scientology is doing a positive in this way? And how did they get to the top of the list? 
Okay, no, I'm not going to concede any such thing, and it's not because I have it in for Scientology or I can't ever acknowledge that there's anything good in it, because I've acknowledged lots of good things in Scientology. I really don't have much of a problem with the Way, the way to Happiness booklet, and I, you know, there's aspects of study tech that are fine and various other things. But when it comes to Scientologists talking about drugs, you're talking about a group of people who really do not know what they are talking about. And when you, t when you say that these materials are well-referenced and cited, referenced to who? Scientology doctors? Because there are Scientology doctors who act as shills for the Narconon programs. And they will assert, with MD after their name, that the Purification Rundown, for example, is a great program that rids a body of toxic elements that it has absorbed over time and that these toxic elements need to be gotten out, such as LSD and uh, toxic fumes and things like that, and alcohol and drugs and pot, right, and heroin. Well, guess what? <laughs> the science that these guys cite for that kind of stuff is a bunch of pseudoscience and bunk. LSD, for example, does not stay in your body. There is not a clear, studied, understood reason why LSD flashbacks occur. But we do know that the, that the reason they, that they occur is not, we know it's not because LSD residuals are staying lodged in the fatty tissues of your, of your body and somehow climbing into your, com, coming loose and going into your brain or something. And this is what Scientologists think, right? Because this is what Hubbard thought. And they have this whole workup that these drugs and stuff stay in your body forever. And I did a whole video on this after getting a, a whole briefing on this whole thing from a biochemist. Uh, so this is, you know, their science is way, way off. Scientology also has the view that all drugs of any kind are bad. Medicinal drugs, pharmaceutical drugs, psychoactive drugs, any drugs, recreational included. And they have, if their literature on this is right out of reefer madness. There is a lot of research being done right now on the medicinal effects of marijuana, specifically THC, right, and the, the various uh, elements of it. And there is some, there are some positive uh, thinking on this. And the other factor, of course, is that, you know, old movies like Reefer Madness and stuff misrepresented, horribly misrepresented, what these drugs actually do. Heroin, I mean, major, you know, heavy-duty uh, drugs, yeah, those have some bad effects on people, and they need to be medically supervised. But pot? I mean, come on. Pot? It, pot is, should, is misclassified by the federal government, and if you look into the history of it, it goes back to the days of Nixon and racism, and there's a lot of nasty stuff mixed up with why pot has such a bad name. Uh, now, I'm not sitting here saying that everybody should be smoking pot every day, but I'm also not saying that they shouldn't, because I can tell you from personal experience that it can be very, very relaxing and very, very helpful to one's state of mind, especially if one is experiencing PTSD or anxiety. Uh, that's my own personal thing on that. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not endorsing anything on a, med on a medical basis. Go see your doctor if you want an endorsement like that. I'm just telling you from my own personal experience that I have found it very useful and helpful. Um, and I have found consistently, one for one, again and again, that the scare stories and alarmist tactics of people, who, of the anti-drug coalition, on this topic to be filled with false information, outright lies, and or exaggerations and hyperbole. So, you know, this is a contentious topic, and I understand if you have moral principles that tell you that all drugs are bad, but realize that's a moral argument, not a scientific one. The science on this is still being done. So, you know, to, so you can, you can definitely use a moral argument if you want to about uh, recreational drugs, and maybe Scientology would have a lot more success if they would go that route, but instead they use pseudoscience. And Hubbard's claims about drugs and the effects of drugs on the mind, I mean, he said a lot about this stuff. I could go on for a very long time telling you all the crazy nonsense that L. Ron Hubbard said about drugs, including drugs on the whole track. In other words, drugs from thousands of years ago that you took that you're still experiencing the ill effects of because of re-stimulation of your mental image pictures. I mean, Hubbard was nuts 
when it came to figuring out how people act. And he had all kinds of fanciful ideas that sounded really nice, but have zero evidentiary uh, data behind them, right? So, I mean, when you're telling people that the reason that they're having problems in their life right now is because they're re-stimulated on drugs that they took 20,000 years ago on some other planet, you know, are these really the guys you want to be listening to about whether you should or shouldn't be taking drugs that actually could be helpful for you in your life right now? I don't think you should. And that's my opinion, but that's what I have to say about that. So, uh, no, I don't think that Narconon is a good program. People have died doing it. I don't think the purification program that they use has any merit whatsoever. And in fact, I think it is dangerous and potentially fatal. And I think their Narconon program as a whole is no more effective than any other drug treatment program out there. And the percentages uh, back me up on that in terms of recidivism, recidivism rate. Say that three times fast. So there you go. Sylvie Grulo. They say that if cult members do write to Hubbard, even now, and he died back in 1986, that he will reply, and that this will not be a letter with a pre-printed signature autograph of his. How can this be? Uh, it's a new one on me, Sylvie. What I do know is this. After L. Ron Hubbard died, okay, first off, while L. Ron Hubbard was around, I think it was in the 1960s or uh, somewhere around there, he set up a series of standing orders. And the very first standing order that was always going to be in force from here on out was SO1. Uh, it's not Sea Org, it's standing order number one. And that order was any letter written to L. Ron Hubbard will be replied to. Uh, and I wrote letters to Hubbard when I was a kid and stuff, and I got replies, so they, they do try to reply to them. Um, but L. Ron Hubbard didn't necessarily see all of them, and there were lots and lots of answers that went out to people that were written by Hubbard's aides. And um, this is something uh, that has been talked about by former Sea Org members. Um, at length. You know, they described how they would just get bags of mail on the ship back in the day uh, addressed to Hubbard, and they would have, you know, answering parties and just have to sit there and answer all these letters and send them all out. Or if they got really backlogged a couple times, I think they just tossed the bags over the side of the ship. And so much for SO1 line, right? Because they were just, just too goddamn busy and didn't care enough about it. Uh, after Hubbard died, the SO1 line stayed in place, and what happened was the executive director international, who at the time, and uh, I guess now, I mean, I don't know who else holds the post or has ever taken it over, but the executive director international was a guy named Guillaume Lesev, and he was the one who was supposed to then take over this line and start getting answers, or getting these letters, and he would answer them. And there were uh, desks set up. Uh, years and years and years ago in every single org uh, to uh, write to Ron or write to management now, the SO1 line. And it's a little box and a little, st you know, stationary and you could write and stick it in the box. And the L. Ron Hubbard communicator, the LC or LRH communicator, which is a post in a Scientolo every Scientology org, would go and pull the letters out and send them on up the line to get answered, but also read them first because Hubbard also said in a secret policy that the SO1 line was a great way to find the disaffected Scientologists and the troublemakers and the, and the rabble-rousers because if they would write that crap up to Ron, all their complaints and problems and issues, then, you know, they would tell other people too and this would be a way of detecting those people and rooting them out and dealing with them. So, as with everything in Scientology, it looks like one thing, but it's really something else, you see. So that's kind of how that line works. And I don't know, I've never heard since L. Ron Hubbard died, anyone claiming that Hubbard was going to be the one answering those letters at this point. That, I just don't think that's true. I think he got some bad data on that one. So, there you go. Peg Gantz. I was helping out with an information table at a local festival being held at the Empire State Plaza in Albany. When I checked in with an organizer for our table location, one of the nearby tables had a sign saying Hubbard Dianetics. I found it very interesting that there was no Scientology designation to be found, although I did observe a number of LRH books, including Dianetics. 
Is this something new, or did they choose not to use Scientology because it was a government-organized event? Uh, good question, Peg. There are, could be a number of reasons why they chose to separate it out. Usually, when, Scien when the Scientologists are going out doing um, the meter tests, the, the, the pinch tests or the stress tests with the e-meters, and they're trying to sell Dianetics books or basic, Scientolo basic Dianetics Scientology books, they'll put up a Dianetics banner because it's less... Um, it's more intriguing and less name recognition than Scientology. And also, Scientologists do kind of consider these things to be kind of separate in a weird kind of way. Dianetics came first, it's book one, and then the Church of Scientology came along a few years later. So the way to appeal to broad, raw public who are not, you know, Scientologists don't know anything about it, is to go in with Dianetics, the modern science of mental health, which is supposed to be a science-based practice. It's not, but it's supposed to be. That's how it positions itself. Go in with that, and that will give you more credibility than going in on a spiritual angle with Scientology uh, where they're trying to appeal to your Thetan, right? So that's the idea. Um, if you were to go to, say, a spiritual book fair or, you know, some kind of wooey sort of thing where there's crystals and astral projection and stuff like that, which Scientologists also go to, that's where you'd probably see them advertising more on Scientology, but they also do Dianetics in those places too. So it's more a matter of trying, that, that's their attempt to try to position themselves in the way that they will be best received by the public at large. And Dianetics definitely has um, not as much name recognition with all the nasty stuff as Scientology does. And some people don't even know that the two things are connected at all. So that's why, they're, that's why they do that. <laughs> it's time for Flash Answers. Becky Mack. Could the answer to why Scientology has such big whales continuing to donate be as simple as this. They get attaboys, plaques, certificates, and tax deductions for the donations. Seems almost too simple to figure. And that it isn't out of any sense of spiritual searching. No, Becky, I actually don't think that's true. Um, whales are people who have literally made themselves fortunes. Sometimes millions and millions and millions of dollars in fortunes. These are not people who are going to be uh, pursuing vanity projects just for the sake of getting some recognition from a little pipsqueak church, right? That's not what they're about. They are all about big picture stuff for the most part. They're very intelligent people for the most part, not all of them by any means, and they understand investments and putting money in and getting money out, and they are spiritually investing in Scientology, and they have bought it hook, line, and sinker. And they want Scientology out into the big wide world. They want everybody on board. They are cult members just like anybody else. They are human beings first before they're a Scientology whale. And so all the things that make somebody a Scientologist are the exact same things that make those guys Scientologists. It's not just about getting plaques. I am positive of that. Brian Torpy. What level on the bridge do you have to obtain to be allowed to pay and become a mission holder? I don't think there's actually a level that's required to obtain in order to be a mission holder in Scientology. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with it to say with 100% certainty that there is no requirement. Maybe you have to be clear. But that would be a new piece of information to me if that was true. I'm not aware of any prerequisites for that, except having the money to pay for the mission holder package. Dave in Chicago. Has the Church of Scientology ever been implicated or strongly suspected to be behind the death of any individual that transgressed the church? Yes, that has happened. It is uh, suspected that Miscavige might have some, had something to do with the quote-unquote suicide of Flo Barnett, who was Shelley Miscavige's uh, mother. She was a disaffected Scientologist who had left the church and was doing services outside Scientology. Um, and I understood that uh, Shelley was pretty pissed at her, and then Flo apparently committed suicide, I believe, with a rifle or shotgun by shooting herself a couple times in the body and once in the head, which is, you know, pretty spectacular way to, to kill yourself. I'm uh, not quite sure how you pull that off, but that's what I understand uh, from that. 
And uh, yes, there have been others, I believe, but none of their names are coming to mind as I'm standing here answering this. So uh, you'll have to Google that. Okay, guys, that is our show for this week. Thank you very much for coming around and listening to me maunder on here as I do. I don't know why you guys keep coming back, uh, but, you know, that's on you. It's not my fault. I'll just keep answering your questions. Uh, if you have uh, found this to be entertaining, informative, and educational, though, I would ask that you consider joining up on Patreon to support this channel and support the work that I do. Every little bit counts and helps and really does uh, help. Uh, keep the lights on here and keep the show going. So thanks for coming around. I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.